What's going on, everybody? This is Black Men Sundays. I'm your host, Corey Sylvester Murray, and we're talking about generational wealth. We're talking about finance, and of course, we're talking about business. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away. I refuse to be the man I was yesterday. Gotta put my best And before we introduce today's guest, my man Eric from Huntsville, Alabama, who do you have for our Black Men Sunday Spotlight, my brother? Hey, thanks, Corey. Um, for those who are new to our podcast, our job here is to always try to stimulate, motivate, and to educate. So with that being said, um, I like to pick some few gems of Black history, things that we don't know. Of course, we know we're taught in schools of the Booker T. Washingtons, the Harriet Tubmans, and the Martin Luther Kings. I have one brother that I want to share with you who I've come across today. Mr. William Washington Brown, what's special about him, he was the first Black man to have a bank, or a Black person marriages to have a bank. So the thing interesting about him, the Savings Bank of the Grand Fountain Unit United Order of True Reformers, founded in 1988, by Reverend William Washington Brown, who was a former Georgia slave. Now, he's the first Black, he is what we can say, has owned the first Black-owned bank in America. Now, on his opening day, the bank received deposits exceeding $1,269, making this an historic milestone. Now, Reverend William Washington Brown founded the bank to safeguard the financial interests of Black depositors provided to provide a secure space where their finances will be monitored by whites. Now, during the 1893 uh, economic depression, while other banks struggled, Brown's Bank thrived. It only not only survived the panic, but it was the sole Richmond bank to pay out the full value of customers to accounts and continue to operate seamlessly. That's my spotlight for today, Mr. Reverend William Washington Brown. Now, Corey, back to you. Fam, you classic. Just uh, finished up. Um, yeah, yeah, man. I was gonna say, what are your thoughts on that game? It was a, it was a good game. Um, I know you guys are heading to the SWAT championship, which is going to be played in Birmingham. Congrats to you know we can't win them all. You know this is our first time probably being in the SWAT championship. You know provided that you know so we, we'll we'll give you that for the first time. So we hope you do well. Much love to fam you. You know I just support my HBCU. So anybody that's doing well. You know, our job is, again, is to stimulate, motivate, and to educate. So, hey, my hat's off to the Rattlers. I hope y'all have a successful uh, season. Well, you do have a half season. I hope you have a successful win. Yeah, definitely, man. And you know what? Where are my manners, man? Happy Thanksgiving. I know you grilling. I know you have some bomb fixings. I already know that turkey. You're probably smoking the turkey knowing you, man. How you cooking that turkey, man? Man, we are, I'm, I'm frying it this year. But I am also going to grill me some, I got some ribs cooking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smoke me a pork butt and some few chicken drumsticks. So, hey, it's going to be on and popping, as pork, always. Pork what, man? I'm telling you, man. Pork you know, butt. Man, I ain't you never know, heard of that. Rice, you never heard of a pork butt? Nah. Man, I, I got you don't as for readings. Y'all don't know nothing about that. But Y'all but... eat. Y'all eat. eat not, never mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna leave that comment to itself. Yeah, we used but, to eat gators. You know, they, we used to eat yeah, gators. Yeah, y'all eat gators. We from the south. We from the we from the south, man. We we eat we really eat down here. So yeah, man. So before I let you go, man, since it's Thanksgiving, I've been having some issues with this question. So whenever I've gone to someone's house for Thanksgiving, especially if they're from like um like North Carolina South. So I'm talking about Alabama. I'm talking about South Carolina, you know, for y'all non-geographic folks. But whenever I wanted some fixings, I would say, can I have some dressing on my stuffing? And everybody kind of looks like some what? I'm like, yeah, can I have some dressing on my stuffing? What are we talking about here? So I'm just saying for, for you, Eric, you're in Alabama. If I'm at your house and I ask you for some dressing on my stuffing, what am I asking you for? Man, you asking for a little um well I'm gonna be honest with you. That's a little new to me. I I don't necessarily put dressing on my stuff and I just put stuffing on my plate. But uh that must be somewhere, you know, maybe a New Orleans thing or uh somewhere else that's deeply rooted, a little bit southern than me. 
But uh, nah, to me, nah, but that's not like, what I'm saying. Hold up, but that ain't what I'm, I'm saying. Like, like when I say dressing, like what do you consider dressing? Oh, all the food, all the food and stuff. You know, the, nah, the, weird looks, see, the nah, presentation. Of nah, that's not what I'm saying. Like is. I'm saying, no, I'm basically for people in the South that are like, what did he just say? Basically, I'm asking in in Southern language, can I have some gravy on my dressing? See how I get confused. Cause I'm I'm talking about Grave stuffing on your dress. On, oh, okay. I didn't yeah, know what see, about, that, but I'm but it's the same thing though. But I'm <laughs> saying can I gravy have some... on his stuffing? That's what he's talking about. You want some gravy on his stuffing with you? Yeah, man. gravy on his that's, stuffing. Yeah, that's that's like not cool in the south. Don't do that, man. That's disrespectful. Man, I, I, I've learned. <laughs> I've learned because <laughs> be... people stuffing, man. Yeah, you're but now... them, make no stuffing. That's what you're telling them. Nah, but here's yeah. what happens though. Whenever I ask them that, they'll look at me crazy and they'll give me like like two spoonfuls of stuffing and i'm like whoa <laughs> because because to them dressing is the stuffing in the gravy so anyway anyway let's go on and get back to it all right let's go on and introduce today's guest the reason why i wanted to start that way because i heard this sister can cook i mean she's been married for 41 years and i don't know nobody that's been married 41 years and they can't cook nothing they call her coach d this sister is a national board certified health and wellness coach 28 years as a licensed nurse. She's also the founder of Uniquely You Well Space LLC. First off, Doretha Thomas Anthony, welcome to Black Men's Sundays and happy Thanksgiving. How you doing today? I'm great. I'm great. I'm very grateful to be here, Corey. Definitely, definitely. We want to have this conversation, but you know, our show is about generational wealth, finance, and business. Mm -hmm. So I want to just warm you up with our first question. So how did you transition from being 28 years as a licensed nurse to being the founder of Uniquely You Well Space LLC? Well, um, a year ago, I would tell you that I was very happy in the job that I had as a wellness coach for a company that I was working for. And really intended to be there until I retired. But some things changed with the company. And because I knew that I was very good at my job and I could coach people for sustainable change, and I was able to see the results of my coaching, I decided to embark on my own company. So that's kind of the driving force behind it. Um, never saw myself as a business person before. It the idea came and I took off with it very quickly. So um, that's kind of how it, how it came to be. Just making a decision that I didn't want to do what I did for someone else when I could do it for myself and help people and reach out to people on a different level. Gotcha. Great information. And, you know, from a level of a lot of people that um, come on Black Men Sundays and a lot of listeners that email me, they say, you know, I'm having some issues where they may want to start their business, but they've been financially afraid to, you know, take that step. So financially, you know, how were you able to set yourself up so that you weren't worried about jumping back in? Well, I actually just used my basic income. Um, we um, have pretty much worked all of our lives and we've saved money. So I just used my income uh, to hire a branding company and uh, use savings, um, some of my savings to um, do some of the things that I needed to do to start my business. Uh, although I wasn't prepared to start a business for several years, I was in a financial situation where I could do it quite conveniently. Definitely, definitely. And you're the founder of Uniquely You Well Space LLC. First off, let's talk about that. What is that? Uniquely You Well Space is an opportunity for me to support people who want to make some changes in their life, meeting them wherever they are in their circumstances. It could be a mental health challenge, a physical health challenge. It could be an emotional health challenge, but I have also dedicated my business to helping caregivers because of my long-term experience with being a caregiver, not only just on the job, but in my personal life, I see the need for people to have support around that. So that's um, the basis of my company. And because I'm a licensed nurse and I have that experience, I'm also able to coach people who maybe just want to improve how they manage their diabetes, their high blood pressure, or some other type of core morbid disease. And one thing we talk about on Black Men's Sunday that we're doing more of, um, we talk about the wealth health conversation, because I feel like the younger brothers and sisters, you know, I'm not really worried about, I'm trying to stack the wealth up. 
I'm not really worried about the health. A lot of brothers are telling me they're not going to the doctor. So, you know, from, you know, being on the side where, you know, you've been a caregiver most of your life, you've seen the, from a young perspective, but then you've seen the other side, you know, when, you know, age kicks in. So for the young brothers and sisters that are listening, that still are struggling with the health versus wealth conversation, what advice can you give? Number one is preparation, preparation and conversation, preparing and having those conversations with the people around you, it, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your parents, uh, if you have a sibling that you know may need care, um, whatever it may be, you have to have those conversations and you have to, it, it may even be uncomfortable. It may be uncomfortable to address those things. And when it comes down to the wealth part of it, it's about having those conversations to see if your family members are financially ready to take care of themselves in the event that they need that care. So, uh, and that has to start early. Uh, we talk about putting money back for college um, tuition for our children. The same thing has to happen for your care later on in life. Um, you may not need it, but what if you do? And most people will. We have millions of people who are depending on someone to take care of them right now in our country. And a lot of them were not financially prepared to have someone come in their home that they could pay. So they end up leaning on their children or sometimes other resources. Definitely. And, you know, I've seen situations where, you know, the family may not have been able to have someone come to the house or they may not have been able to, you know, take that family member to a facility. So a lot of times they'll say, you know what, maybe, you know, whoever's the lowest breadwinner, you just quit your job, take care of that. But, you know, this Black Men's Sunday. So I want to talk about the challenges for Black men, right? Because a lot of times, like when you're faced to be a caregiver, it's not like, you're prepared. A lot of times it, it hits you all of a sudden, but sometimes there is preparation. So for black men, what can we do if we're in the situation where, okay, we're the one that we may need to get, you know, let our job go to take care of the family member, because the way I was raised, you know, is family job, and then everything else falls in place. It's not job family. You know, actually I'm saying that all, I'm all messing up. My mom going to kill me and it's Thanksgiving. No, it's God first family, then job. But when you're in the situation to where, okay, you're going to be the caregiver, how can you financially pre prepare to take care of that loved one as a Black man? Definitely. Uh, I see more and more Black men um, now taking care of their parents. And it can be very challenging uh, because in most cases, they are not prepared. They haven't had those conversations. But if it were to happen, the first thing to do is to get advanced directives. Find out from your loved one, if there's no cognitive impairment that has started, then have those conversations. Mom, where do you, where do you wanna be buried? You know, do you wanna live out the rest of your life in the home? Uh, would you be open to going to a facility? You know, having those conversations. Find out if they've put any money back to help take care of these things. Um, I've heard of people, you know, leaving their jobs to take care of their family members. But I think as we go forward, in order to really take care of our family, you have to take care of your own needs first. And that may not be giving up a job. Uh, in most cases, people at 65 and 70 years old may not be prepared to not have an income, sometimes late 60s uh, or early 60s. People are working longer and they're living longer. So a person may not be able to give up their job in their 50s or early 60s to financially take care of a parent. I have that own personal journey myself. And although my dad uh, has you know, a pretty good income with today's rates for staying in a facility and having someone take care of you day to day, it still wasn't enough. So that preparation really needs to start early. If you are a child of a parent and you think you may become a caregiver, you know, it's okay for you to put back money that maybe you can help pay for a caregiver. 
it's nothing wrong with doing that as well. But I don't see a lot of people leaving their jobs. I don't see that as much. What I see people do is try to balance um, and juggle the caregiver role while they work, which can be quite difficult. So let's talk about that, you know, so, but let's say, you know, we're in a situation to where is there support systems? How can, you know, how can someone find support? Every state, every county has caregiver support groups. There's things like senior services. Um, there's support groups for people who become caregivers. If your family member is in the hospital and you think they're going to have to have care, there's um, social workers as well that you can reach out to. They're very helpful. And that was, those are the main places for finding support. And definitely on Black Men Sundays, we've had guests that were big proprietors of investing in life insurance. Mm -hmm. So can, can investing in life insurance help aid you financially as a caregiver? Life insurance is paid out when the person dies. So that may not help you during the process. Having some type of caregiver policy, and there are some out there, that can be very helpful. And you, the best person to ask about those things would be maybe your family attorney. They can be very helpful to help you with the right ones. So I, I want to transition to the power of attorney. You know, when, okay. some, when someone dies, what happens to the power of attorney? So the power of attorney is no longer active after a person dies. Uh, so you need what they call a durable power of attorney. And the best thing for a person to have is a will, because then you can go to the will, find out what the person's wishes are, what they, uh, what they want, where they want to be placed after their death, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and when you say, uh, durable power of attorney, are, are you referring to medical durable power of attorney, meaning um, that the person is no longer able to make decisions for themselves? Is that what that means? Just to clarify. The um, durable power of attorney gives a person's access to the other person's finances, as well as decisions. You can make any decision for that person. You can go to the bank and take out a loan in that person's name. You can make all kinds of decisions. But the good thing about having a durable power of attorney is you can help your loved one manage their finances without them having the strain of having to do that maybe after they're no, lang no longer able to do that as well as they were before. Okay. And I kind of want to backtrack a little bit because I feel like uh, my grandma going to slap me when mm -hmm. I ask you this. And a lot of grandmas going to slap me when I ask you this question, but I'm <laughs> tired of going through this. So I feel like in my family, like we don't know health history we mm -hmm. find out health history when that person is dead like it's like or right. when they get sick and they're in the hospital and they're calling you on your job hey you need to leave now just i'm not going to tell you what's going on just come to the hospital like and then you find the health right. history so i feel right. like as black people though a lot of and some families i'll give them credit some families do you know, hey, don't don't drink all that Hennessy. Don't drink all that that brown. You know, our family's got a lot of people got diabetes, got sugar now. You need to slow it down. Eating all that them ho hos and candies. You know, but right. if you're in the dark, because you know we talk about generational wealth, but generational health is part of the game too, right? Absolutely. So Number how one. can we, as Black people, change the framework of the generational makeup? as far as being more admittant of your health history versus saying we're not, we're going to keep it a secret until it's too late. So it's too late. Again, conversation. Uh, I, I knew for me personally, I knew all about my mom's and dad's health history because I was a nurse. I was interested. Um, and because I was a nurse, I asked questions, but it's a good idea to ask those questions to your mom and dad. You know, mom, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have diabetes? Uh, what kind of medicines are you on? And uh, who is your doctor? Just as simple as knowing who is their doctor and them actually signing forms at their doctor's office so that you can have direct contact with their doctors. That's another good thing because if something happens, that doctor can't tell you anything without their permission. And let's say that they're not able to talk. So 
I uh, encourage people to, you know, have those conversations with your loved ones, you know, finding out. And, and the good time is Thanksgiving, you know, around the Thanksgiving table, maybe during dessert. I don't know. But it's very, very important to have these conversations, to find out health history. You know, what did my grandparents die of? What caused their death? Um, what type of things did your aunt and uncles die of? Or what type of illnesses do they suffer from? You know, having those conversations. And I do think it's easier now. I think people are a little bit more educated about knowing the importance of this. So I do see it more. But just having all those things in place, you know, the advanced directives, the healthcare power of attorney is an opportunity for you to speak on this person's behalf if they cannot speak for themselves. But those things have to be done and notarized. Uh, knowing if a person wants to be put on life support. Uh, you know, life support can really eat away at your finances. So you, you may have money in the bank that you want to give to your grandchildren, but if you end up on life support, that may not happen. So, um, and some people want that at age 60, but when they're 85, they may not care about having all those measures taken in case they are in need of life support. So having those conversations, updating those conversations, and then keeping those conversations going is key. But you mentioned okay. life support finances. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about caregiving expenses, but, you know, because we talk about, you know, stock market investing. We talk about 401ks, Roth 401ks, but we don't talk about the caregiving, the health finances. So just, you know, let's just talk numbers for a little bit, like life support finances. Like what? how much are we talking about here? The average day cost for a life support bed is probably $25,000, $30,000 a day on average, okay? Now, you may have insurance. You probably have Medicare insurance. You may have some type of supplemental insurance, but 20% of that usually ends up back on the person to pay. Uh, if that person stays on life support for a substantial amount of time and then they do pass away, that bill, sometimes can be taken against the estate. You know, hospitals do that. They will claim, uh, file a claim against the estate. So um, like I said, there's nothing wrong with life support if that's what a person wants. But, you know, if my children were to ask me at 55, do I want life support? Yeah, I absolutely do. But at 85, I may not care about that. So Again, and I hate to be so repetitive here, but it, it truly is about continuing those conversations and updating them as time goes on because things do change. Let's talk about caregiving expenses. So I'm a black man. I need to take care of an aunt, grandparent or something. What type of expenses will I have? So let's say you have someone in your home and they want to stay your mother. Let's say your mother lives in her home and she needs a caregiver. And lots of times these things happen through a doctor. A doctor will assess the situation. Safety is number one. So if your mom starts to be unsafe in her home, she's falling, she's having accidents, she's burning food on the stove, she's hurt herself. When those things start to happen, then the doctor will say, this person needs 24 hour care. And when that happens, that could cost you anywhere from twenty-five to thirty dollars an hour. Wow, wow! Yeah. I'm gonna um pass the mic to my man Kalali. Wow, I do. Uh, so I do want to. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for for spending some time with us on Sunday. We really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Um, I want to take. I guess I want to take you back even more basic than what we've been talking about uh, so far. Thanks. Like, so I'm 44 years old, right? And, um, you know. I hate to say it, but I didn't actually get like a primary care physician until I was like, mm. like, like three, four years ago, you yeah. know? So, and I find like a lot of brothers are in the same position, even my age that don't have primary care physicians and stuff like that. So what would you say is like the prime age that you should really be looking to get a primary care physician? And then, you know, what should you do with that primary care physician? <laughs> so 
once a person ages out to a primary care physician is usually 18 because most of the time you'd have a pediatrician until you're 18, sometimes yeah. 21. Some doctors will hold on to their patients till they're 21. Yeah. So surely by 21, you should have your own primary care physician. Um, you should also be seeing your primary care physician at least once to twice a year. If you have no uh, medical issues that you're managing with medication, once or twice a year is fine. As men get into their thirties now, there are prostate issues, especially with black men. They do happen as young as 30 years old. High blood pressure, high cholesterol is another that happens a lot in age 30 year, uh, 30s, but don't what I would ex say to anyone is don't expect your doctor to take care of you. You have to take care and advocate for yourself. And by doing that, it means, okay, it's June. I haven't had a physical this year. I had one last June. It's time for me to call my doctor. The best thing to do is to schedule those maybe on your birthday month. You know, every year, if you're born in November, every year in November, I'm going to have my physical with my doctor and they can check your blood pressure. They can check your cholesterol. They can screen you for certain things. Uh, even testicular cancer is very prominent in, in black men. It's not something that's talked about a lot, but it's very prominent. But if your parents have any type of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, those type of things, getting to that doctor once a year or every six months to be screened is paramount. There's a lot of brothers, I know brothers like this, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of brothers out there that like, yeah. you know what I'm saying, don't even have like health insurance, you know what I mean? Oh, wow, wow. So, you know, cause especially now, so like we're in an interesting time period right now where it's like, we're, you know, and I and I feel like the black community is is feeling this more right now because oftentimes we feel like the worst brunt of of social changes before everybody else. So I feel like the black community is feeling this more. And what I'm talking about is like it, we're kind of in a stage of transition where you've got like you've got like a lot of people who are employed and traditionally healthcare comes from your employment system. Mm -hmm. so you've got a lot of people who are like freelancing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they might be. They might be working for Uber, but Uber is not a is not an employer right. the way you think of Uber as right. an Uber right. is like a, is like a contractor. You know what I'm saying? Right. So essentially, you're a self employed driver who happens to contract with Uber, right. which means they're not responsible for your health care. So then, right. health insurance gets unanswered. So and and then we look at it. Okay, well, I'm making this amount of money now. They're saying even with Obamacare, they're saying I got to pay this amount of money, whatever that amount of money might be. You know what I mean? To mm -hmm. get my health insurance and people are deciding that instead of getting their health insurance because of inflation or whatever else, mm -hmm. they're going to use that money, you know, to pay bills or things like that. So could you talk to us a little bit about like the benefits of having health insurance and like oh, yeah. how the money that you pay in health insurance might benefit in the long run? Mm -hmm. Well, you think about it. Um, you can't afford not to have it. Okay. If you end up in a hospital uh, without health insurance, $10,000 a day is about the average cost for a bed in the hospital per day. That's for any, um, any type of disease management. Now, if it's something more serious, maybe dialysis, maybe cancer treatment, um, something like that, then the cost just goes up. Mm -hmm. So what people need to understand is you can't afford not to have it. Um, it may seem like, oh, okay, I'm paying out a hundred and some dollars a month for this insurance, but I only see my doctor twice a year. And, and you might think, well, but that's 1200, it could be $1,200 a year. And that $1,200 a year and that screening could save your life. So um, there used to be a time where you couldn't get health insurance unless you had a job. That's not the case now. And you can advocate for your own health insurance by going to all these uh, different health plans online. You can go to Aetna. You can reach out to Humana. You can reach out to Blue Cross Blue Shield on your own. You don't have to have an um, employer to do that. And by doing that, I mean, it's, it's kind of like having insurance on your car. Okay. 
Now in your state, it might be mandatory, but would you truly drive around in a car with no insurance, knowing that if someone hits you or if you hit someone, then you're going to have to pay for that. So, and your health is number one. Your health is your wealth. Because if you have, if you don't have good health, it doesn't really matter how much money you have. So, and, and money can be wiped out very quickly if your health takes a, a negative hit. So I would say you can't afford not to have it. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know, uh, and Corey can back me up on this one. We had a guest that came on here and said, yeah, he told us, he was like, you know, having a million dollars in the bank is great. You know, it's better than having a million dollars being healthy enough to get out there and spend that money. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, you talk, uh, well, actually let me, let me transition a little bit. So we, we, um, you talked about, you know, what you what you've done personally in terms of business, like you were working for somebody and then you moved into your, your own business. Now you're working for yourself. So, um, could you talk to us a little bit about like what might be the difference in the mentality between working for, you know, having a, I guess we call it a traditional job, like working for somebody and then now being self-employed and working for yourself? Like what were, were there any changes you had to make in your mentality, how you approach your work? Well, I realized that I have to be very patient. Um, you have to market yourself. You have to be comfortable doing things just like what I'm doing now, uh, being on video, talking to people, showing up talking to people, uh, telling them about what I do, um, and just being able to tell them how passionate I am about what I do. Um, so I think that's the part that, of course, I've never had to do before. I showed up for a job before, and I always did my job well, and I got paid. It was pretty simple. But this this is different. I have to be very patient. I um, have to market. Uh, I have to learn when people say no, that that doesn't mean no for me. It just means no for them. So I have to, I've, I've come to accept that. I've learned that quite well, quite um, easily in the early parts of, of doing business and trying to get people to um, connect with me and send me referrals for um, people to coach. I had to learn that that doesn't mean no for me. It just means no for them. So that's my perspective. Um, at my age, uh, I've seen and learned and done and experienced a lot of things. So that has just made me ready for having a business. Uh, I feel like I'm more ready than I ever have been. And um, people would say, well, gosh, why didn't you start a business years ago? Years ago, I wasn't ready but I feel more ready to do that than I ever have been. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I just, thank you. I appreciate everything you said. I, um, you know, for myself, you know, I don't always uh, pay attention to my health because mm -hmm. I have two kids, I got one of them that, you know, and I'm always working, I'm always putting, you know, stuff that I need to do for work ahead of it. So this is good just to reiterate to me, because at the same time, like I said, I have two kids. I want to be around yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. to see them grow. So like, this really just, it's just, it's just a good reminder for me and reiterate to me, you know, that I need to be focusing on my health, not in, not only, you know, just in my life, but also in my, when I'm sitting down and playing financially, I need to be having a health plan and health strategy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. That's one way for you to be there for your future, for your children. So you can see them grow and learn and aspire to be who they want to be is to by taking care of yourself first. Self-care is number one. If you don't see, take care of you, no one else will. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and see, that's how I feel. I feel like, so the interesting thing is, because me and Corey talk about this a lot. Like, the interesting thing is when I look around, I see Black women doing so much, like advancing so far. Like, you got you got your own business. I know a lot of Black women who have their own businesses. Like, even like even my colleagues at work. Okay, I got to, you know, Corey talk about, you know, all the time. Like, if you go listen to some other shows, how I got a master's degree in public policy. I have one graduate degree. A lot of the women I know that are sitting, that sit beside me or work with me that are Black women, they have two, three. You know what I'm saying? They have, you know, like my wife got like two, three advanced degrees. Like, like, right. so right. I guess this is just one to, to tip my hat to black women and say, you know, that's great. But another way that, that it seems like black women are ahead of us as, as, as black men or as just men in general is y'all have started actually focusing on self-care as a value. 
You know what I mean? And it's like, I think it's time for us as black men to kind of take a little step back, you know, uh, you know, uh, along with, you know, trying to pick up everything else that we're doing, kind of take a step back and say, hey, we need to focus on a little bit of self-care too. Right, Develop right. language and how we can, you know, get that message across. So again, really appreciate you, everything you said. I'm going to take, I'm gonna take away, what I'm going to take away from this is health as well. That's what I'm going to yeah. take away. Well, I would say too, is when it comes to black women, we didn't have much of a choice. We've no. always been looked at, you know, and when we show up, it's how we are looked at that's going to matter. So we kind of had to start there. And then, um, you know, when we have children and we want to be around for our children, just like I'm telling you, you want to be around for your kids. We take mm -hmm. care of ourselves so we can take care of them and our husbands and, and that sort of thing and our parents, whatever the case may be. So health is wealth. Absolutely. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi, Andro. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I just want to first say a comment that I am super proud of you, Aunt Doe, for what you're doing. Um, you know, you're like my second mother, and you are the best outside of my mother, the best cook on this planet. She can <laughs> throw down. I'm telling you, that woman, <laughs> oh, if you ever get her cooking, it's amazing. Also, I wanted to say that to uh, piggyback of what you were talking about, we had a conversation back in July and I called you with a medical issue, but I didn't think it was that serious. I was like, I think I'm fine. You know, I just, I'm going to be okay. She was like, no, go to the doctor and get checked out. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll go. And when I did that, I winded up in the ICU for four days. So it was something actually serious. And thank God I had health insurance because mm -hmm. it was very, very expensive. But in my mind, again, I do have regular checkups. I am a female. So, you know, I definitely go to the doctor once, maybe even twice a year. But in this instant, I thought I would be okay. And I was like, well, let me just listen to my aunt. She is a nurse. She knows what she's talking about. But that actually saved my life. And mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and you know, we do start our season two for our podcast. You know, I'm going to have you come on the show in January. So I haven't forgot about you. So okay. I'm definitely going to put you on, uh, with me and the, uh, ladies for the compilations of banter. So, but I'm, I'm super proud of you and thank you for that again, back in July and all that you do, because you're an amazing woman. I'm a super proud of you. You're my favorite aunt and I love you to death. So congrats. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I will say that this will be Dr. Chrissy Webster in a few months. So she's working on her PhD. I'm very proud of her. I have a lot of nieces and nephews, and I'm very proud of all of them. They're very supportive. See what I'm saying? Y'all be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to kind of piggyback. We talked about the medical responsibility of everything. But I want to kind of piggyback off of when you talk about the financial responsibilities of having a will. Um, I like to throw in that uh, not, also, not only is it important to have a will, but we should also look at maybe having a trust set up as well. Oh, definitely. Yes. Because a trust, you know, for those who know about a trust, you know, a trust gives us um, immediate control um, over the provisions of the real estate or any kind of property mm -hmm. that you have. Because again, when, you, when someone, when your loved one passes away and, and pa what well, passes away, it goes into probate and probate right. can take, you know, whatever. And like you said, if you have household expenses and different mm -hmm. things that the previous person that died, all that would go towards that. And you really would end up with mm -hmm. much nothing. So That's I just wanted to, again, just kind of piggyback off what you were saying about uh, making mm -hmm. sure we set up trust, um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that's some kind of form of control for that as well. Right. But right. everything you're saying, A, is spot on about uh, making sure you get checked out, health insurance and everything. I'm, I'm glad we have this format that we can educate um, others about the importance mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the, having these things. Yes, absolutely. And I think for our Black community, it's so vitally important because honestly, as a nurse, the worst case scenarios that I have seen in my field as a nurse, a lot of times were our other black people. And I, we are getting more educated. The trust thing, like you were talking about, is something that people are talking about a lot more. And we've learned more about that. 
So definitely a trust. But if you can't, if you don't do a trust, definitely have a will. Um, but uh, absolutely, a trust is is the best way to go because then you can bypass probate court, and I think it actually saves you money uh, in the long run. And we, we definitely need to do that any way that we possibly can. Uh, this is Tanisha in Charlotte, North Carolina. I just want to say. Um, that this is an awesome topic um, and I'm glad that you have this on your podcast and can share with others because it's a, it's a conversation uh, I don't think a lot of black people have and it's, it's important to have this discussion and um, you know, it's uncomfortable. You don't really want to talk about your parents or, you know, dying or anything like that, but it's, it's something that needs to be discussed because I've seen with, you know, my own grandparents, um, you know, the expenses and how that goes. And, you know, also when you've got multiple, you know, siblings, you know, one sibling doesn't always agree with the other one. And so, you know, the power of attorney and all that needs to be in place because sometimes, you know, they get, they have disagreements and they may not follow through with what, you know, the parents uh, wanted. So I think all of that stuff is important and it's, a, a great conversation uh, to have with your family. Absolutely. So thank you for all that information. Yeah, great information. Great information. And my man, Kalali, you know, you're talking about sisters with degrees. Um, The sister from <laughs> Charlotte, how many degrees do you have? I have two master's degrees, uh, one in communication and one in marketing. Wow. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I've been, I've been looking around <laughs> and I'm like, I thought I was you know, doing it with my little one master's degree. I'm like, I need to go back and get some more certifications and some more degrees because right now, you know what I'm saying? These sisters is outpacing us, but we also understand that, you know, they got to show up three times as hard to get, you know, the same treatment. So, but, Absolutely. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, maybe I don't say it enough. So maybe this is an opportunity for me to say it on a public platform. Definitely hat, hats off to black sisters for that. Well, thank you thank you achieving, achieving and overachieving <laughs> thank you yeah um, so I guess... I know, real quick i'm sorry chrissy from greensboro north carolina i forgot to introduce that part of it um do you have a certain insurance that you recommend for um people in general just no. any type just like a number no. one i think being insured is better than no insurance at all uh, I think uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield does a great job, especially with the older adults. I've seen that with my own experiences with my dad and my mom. Their insurance paid very well. Uh, they go to the doctors. Uh, their regular doctor's appointments was like maybe $20 out of pocket, which I thought was very inexpensive. So uh, there, I think Blue Cross does, then Blue Shield does really well here in North Carolina. But I think being insured is better than no insurance at all. So anyway, I want to I want to jump back in, though, you know, but I, I kind of want to jump on the entrepreneurial side of things, because the brother we had on a week ago, he said, you know, he tells people, OK, you want to quit your job, be an entrepreneur. How many hours are you trying to work? They were saying, I'm trying to work from like nine to twelve. He's like, nah, you mean like nine a.m. to midnight. So what kind of like what kind of schedule you work? Uh, for me, uh, my ideal schedule is Monday through Thursday. I don't mind uh, being available to coach people after 5 p.m., but I would limit that uh, to make sure that I am able to care for myself and do the things that I do that fill in that time. So, uh, But my ideal hours are Monday through Thursday from uh, 9 to 4. Um, again, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't mind telling you I just turned 63 years old. So uh, what I do now, I want to do it at a level that feeds me. And I don't mean feeds me food. I'm talking about, you know, just feeds my soul. It gives me the opportunity to truly, truly support people, be there for them, see them grow, see them make sustainable changes that can help them to improve their life. That's what's important to me. Uh, so nine to four is um, the best time for me, Monday through Thursday. Um, I'm doing it on a more of a uh, more mature level. If I was 10 years younger, I'd probably do six days a week, you know, just to be available uh, six days a week, Monday through Saturday. But at this point in my life, that's that's the best hours for me. 
Yeah, I got you. You're working on that mature level. But, you know, I get it, too. I kind of get that that double entendre because, you know, that mature mean that mature financial as well to be able to do it nine to four for for Monday through Thursday as well. Right. So definitely. So before I let you get out of here, you enjoying yourself on Black Men Sundays? Black Men Sundays is awesome. I'll be spreading the word. I I have uh, two sons and a wonderful husband, and I'm going to encourage them to listen and follow um, with Black Men Sundays. I think it's a, a great opportunity for them to learn something and to uh, to see Black men at work doing very good things that's going to help people. Yeah, that's what we need more of in the world, whether it's um, coming from you or, or any of the people who work with you. I think you're doing a great job. Definitely. Thank you. And you know, it's Thanksgiving. So I was going to say, you know, what's on your plate? You know, I heard you can cook, you know, <laughs> sister from sister. the cheese rolls. He makes <laughs> the best yeast rolls in the oh world. My God. <laughs> I mean, that Absolutely. is her signature. <laughs> see, now they wanna, see, Corey, now they want to talk. You see that? <laughs> now we have food. I mean, you know. Of course, everyone now they have something about to food. say. Yeah, 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 I heard him come on. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I was saying everybody wants to talk about now. food, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, I've taught them how to cook. Uh, I, my son, who's on with us today, cooks very, very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people enjoy his cooking as much as they do mine, and they look forward to it. For me, uh, it's just me and my husband this year, but we are going to um, smoke a turkey on our Kamado grill and have a few sides, not too many things, since it's just the two of us. But yeah, we're looking forward to it. Hey, Eric, why are you looking like that when she says smoke it? I see Eric kind of like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, the South standing, like, yeah, the South got something to say. Smoking. <laughs> Are you a smoker too, Eric? But yeah, no, I love to smoke. Actually, right now, believe it or not, I'm smoking some ribs as we speak. Oh, so right. I'm um uh, they about to come off the grill. I got them all wrapped up. I put to put some little little sauce on them and let them kind of get that good glaze on and put them back on the grill. Wow. Them wow. they, they fall off the bone, ready to eat. Wow. Sounds good. So I'm, a, I'm a smoker. I'm a griller too. So yeah, I like I like good. to cook. Yeah. Sounds mm-hmm. great. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow. But, um, you know, the mic kind of got overtaken, but I'm just saying, like, it's Thanksgiving. I'm going to call you Auntie Doretha. You know, I'm in Florida. You know, if I was in New York, I'd be like Aunt Doretha, but I'm in Florida. Auntie Doretha, what's going to be on your plate for Thanksgiving? Well, we're looking at smoked turkey. I'll make some homemade bread. Uh, we'll probably have um, greens um, and sweet potatoes. And there'll have to be dressing with gravy. Uh, you know, you just can't do Thanksgiving without dressing. So that's probably going to do it for me. And maybe a dessert. I haven't decided what yet. I want to thank Mrs. Doretha Thomas Anthony. 41 years of marriage. I'm still like looking at that like, wow, that is awesome. Because I'm only, I'm a few, me and Kalali the same age. I ain't put my age on here. Even though you can see the grays coming in, I'm kind of struggling well, with it. Said, well, the pepper struggling, man. Up. Even hey man, even though you're like what like a month older than me, so yeah, it ain't a month. I'm like I'm like two weeks older oh, than you. Oh man, hey, two whatever, weeks. man. Anyway, wow. <laughs> so well, yeah, that's another podcast. If you want to have me back to talk about 41 years of marriage, I'm happy to come. Oh, definitely. We we can do that. <laughs> we can do that. And before I let you go, um, Dr. Chrissy, so did you say you have a podcast? I do. It's called the Compilations of Bant Her. So it focuses on a lot of her type topics hate her, love her, please her, et cetera. Um, We start in season two in January. I know it's the holidays, so it's four ladies. And um, we're trying to start with him um, in January. So to be hate him, love him, please him, et cetera. So uh, it's not like you think when you're thinking of the topics. We, we, um, We change things up quite a bit. We make it funny and entertaining. My aunt has definitely listened to it multiple times. We're going to have her on there with self care. Uh, we are trying to get some special guests, some men on there. But yes, I, I love doing it. I love uh, speaking my voice. I'm starting to, I guess, open up a little bit more on that. But um, we definitely would love you guys to come on if you would like. Um, I know my aunt has my information, so if you want to get that from her, we would we would greatly appreciate that. So yeah, get well, y'all's I mean, opinion out. You have to be honest. 
you have to be very blunt because that's what we like. Okay. <laughs> you know, well, I'll just I'll just tell you have your publicist contact us because we on that oh. publicist stage kind of level. But I was going to say okay. too. But see, here's the thing too: as black men, right? We're not competing with you. We we about to collaborate. See, that's Absolutely. the problem. So we're not Absolutely. at the bottom. You know, like we're trying to climb the ladder to success escalator style. So we not, <laughs> com- we not competing, that. we collaborating. That's but anyway, right. say the spell the name of your podcast. Spell it for me. The compilations, compilations of banter. So that's the B-A-N-T-H-E-R. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted you to clarify that because the people are gonna be yeah. like, Yeah, hey, I couldn't find it. So, compilations yep yeah, of bant her yes okay, yes definitely. please check us out we're on every platform spotify our heart radio etc so yeah check us out okay yeah i see she ready i'm I'm just mad she i'm, I'm just mad she a podcaster and don't have a mic though but it's all good though I, i'm at home i'm at home i am and too I, got the text message and I was like i was about to go get some dinner and i was like you know what let me wait let me support my aunt this is more important i can my stomach can grow a little bit longer it's okay I, i'm okay with that Oh, that's Absolutely. what that noise was. I kept hitting mute. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm hitting mute on Eric stomach. not realizing it's you, Lord. It's, it's <laughs> okay, I ain't gonna lie. You got my cousin on there too, Tanisha. Hi, Tanisha. Hi, love. It's <laughs> Aggie Pride. Aggie, Aggie Pride. Pride. That's right. That's right. <laughs> From Clemens, North Carolina. Yes. yes. Thanks for coming on Black Men Sundays. Thanks for blessing the stage. Enjoy the rest of your Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. Coach D. I'm gonna call you Auntie Dorita. <laughs> and we definitely gonna have you back because I mean, you know, married 41 years, right? We talk about generational wealth. Guess what? Is it marriage? I think that's an investment as well. So it let's is. have that conversation. Matter of fact, I'm gonna book you in 2024. I already have your head shot. We good I'll to go. Here. That's I'll right. Thank definitely. you, Corey. Thank, Thank you. you, Mrs. Doretha Thomas. Many blessings. Happy Thanksgiving. And thanks for coming on Black Men Sunday, sister. And enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your holiday. Enjoy the rest of the year. Thank you. God bless you Happy all. Thanksgiving. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away.